Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will start today's episode, number 200 of the Animal Training Academy podcast show, where I am pumped to firstly just be here and be doing this. Thank you to everyone who listens to this show. I know some of you have literally been listening since day dot, and boy, am I grateful to you. But also for those that might have just discovered us, welcome and huge appreciation for following this odyssey of animal training and behavior that we've been on together since January 2016. What a ride. And being up to 200 episodes, we're in a position where we can have traditions. I think we can do that. What do you think, Susan? I love traditions when they involve ATA. (laughs) And so traditionally, for every 50th episode, we have the marvellous Susan Friedman join us. You can hear her in previous episodes number 150 and 100. If you don't know Susan, though, she is a professor emeritus at the Department of Psychology at Utah State University. And amongst many other things, she teaches seminars and courses on animal learning online, including her very popular How Behaviour Works, LLA, Living and Learning with Animals course, which, correct me if I'm wrong, Susan, but has now seen students from 63 different countries. Yeah, around that. I think it might be one or two more as of the last class. But isn't that extraordinary how small we're making the world around behavior science and uh, learning? Yeah. And I know uh, Zoo I was working, I am working at, just hired a new person and they were very excited to know that they had just completed LLA. And they're like, you yeah, love working here. <laughs> um, That's great. Part of that course and something that has for me been a cornerstone of the work that I've done over the last 13 years since you and I first met Susan and at the time when I immediately took your LLA course is your FADE form, Functional Assessment and Intervention Design. As all of us know who work with animals, that learning never stops and that we really do need a broad knowledge and experience base or at least a connection to a community of people that have that to handle the variety of challenges we might face. And at any stage of our careers and journeys, we are inevitably going to hit rough patches in our training and get stuck, which can lead us to feeling frustrated overwhelmed and sometimes just helpless and I know I was definitely feeling some of those things when I first met you and I remember at the Parrots Australia 2010 conference in Australia you did a talk and then you passed out a bunch of these fade forms and I remember sitting there and and filling one out about Kingy a black breasted buzzard I was working with at the time and if you listening don't know what a black breasted buzzard is, it's an Australian raptor. Look them up. They are super cool. I won't share the surprise of what you'll find when you look them up, but you'll be pleasantly surprised. Anyway, at Ken's Tropical Zoo, where I was working at the time, when we went into the area we used to house Kingy, he used to jump down to the ground and grab our shoes. I filled out the fade form at the conference and amongst other learnings, came up with a plan to station train Kingy when we were in there. Went back, implemented it with immediate results. I was reinforced and have been ever (laughs) since. 
I've now used your fade form for countless animals and situations and teach it to others. And so I'm excited for today's episode to focus in on various aspects of this super important tool for helping us get unstuck. To get started, and for those listening, Susan, who might not know what the fade is, can you share with everyone what it is, why it's important, and also share when we might want to reach for this tool? Yeah, well, thank you for that great introduction. I mean, not of just me, but even of the uh, great celebration that's warranted uh, for your podcast. Thanks for including me. I hope we do it forever, every 50. And um, for a really great setup about what that fade form is, functional assessment and intervention design worksheet. Um, I will say that although people often refer to it as mine, that everything that I do is essentially informed by my first 20 years of my career, um, working with uh, teachers and kids who had special learning needs, or maybe it would be more accurate to say kids for whom the standard school setup was not working. And that puts the responsibility in the environment rather than in the child. Um, and so everything really that I've contributed in the non-human animal world has been informed um, by my past learning history, which for a long time was mostly special education. Education, uh, through a behavior analysis lens. Now I have 25 years in the non-human um, learning and behavior world. And so the, um, the balance is shifting, which is kind of fun and interesting. So the functional assessment and intervention design form comes by many names. I think I gave it that name, um, but it's very common in all school districts and is part of developing a specialized, custom-fit individual education plan, IEP, for children. And I remember when I sort of dusted that off and connected the dots um, from my work with companion parrots at the time, early 2000s, to this school district form. And I sent it into my list of uh, teacher assistants in the early, early version of LLA, which was called LLP, Living and Learning with Parrots. And it was a free course, essentially, um, through a Yahoo listserv. And uh, I, I asked for $50 donations from the students, which they would send directly to the different organizations that I would pick for each session. I look back on those early days with such fondness because it still provides the, the pillars on which LLA and all of my work is standing now. And there's something so satisfying um, so sturdy when you can look back 20 years and still have relevance in the early, you know, the origins of, of your work. Um, and that's because it was based on the work of many people for the many decades before that um, and not breakthroughs or inventions, you know, two kind of poison words for me. Um, I prefer to know the line of shoulders that I'm standing on and to continue to acknowledge them, to continue to find them and acknowledge them. Well, the fate form is meant to give people a systematic approach to asking our most fundamental questions when our job is to understand a behavior pattern, um, to predict when it happens so that we can change the environment to predict something more successful instead, and um, to change behavior when it's necessary. And so I always put the when it's necessary part in that description, because by no means is every behavior we want to understand and predict necessarily on the block for change? You know, sometimes it's good to just say, what's the reinforcer for that? And under what conditions do we see it? And that gives us that understanding and predictability that is often enough. But when we do need to change behavior, that is when the learner's life will be improved and also the family, the caregivers, the zookeepers, the um, 
conspecifics, other animals are impacted by an individual's behavior uh, such that change is needed, then this worksheet leads you through asking some of the questions that should result in at least a tentative approach, programmatic um, view of how to do that with the least intrusive, effective solution. So the worksheet is broken up into sections that reflect what is now common knowledge. But at the time, early 2000s, seemed really strange and pushed hard against the cultural fog. Those questions are centered around our smallest meaningful unit of analysis, ABC, antecedent behavior concept, sort of the heart of everything we elaborate um, to understand, predict, and change behavior with the least intrusive principle in mind. So there's a section that taps on ABC uh, antecedents, the A, and then a well-operationalized description of behavior, and then asks function, what's the consequence? This is so... Um, it, it's so miraculous I, or something big like that, revolutionary for people who don't already hold this information, for them to respond to these questions as a way of solving behavior problems can be so life-changing to teach people within each one of those sections are these our most precious lessons about behavior. For example, um, what's the difference between a behavioral description and labels? And why are labels not useful to us? And what are the conditions in which behavior is likely to occur? And how are antecedent conditions different than causes? And then the concept of function, that the behavior isn't what's important, it's the outcome the behavior produces that's important. And the realization that all of us on the planet are able to change the behavior. We can do different things to get a particular valued outcome, which opens the door to incredible flexibility and, and learning. And then it goes on to the section that asks about, you know, what do you want the animal to do instead? And that's our concept of protecting the valued reinforcers, the problem behavior is producing. And um, asks what new skills, because new skills uh, are our best, I think, connection to the concept of freedom, that the more skills a learner has, the more ways they can solve problems. And that's really to be free, to have a full toolbox of solutions. Um, so it goes on then to kind of seal the deal by asking who's going to do what, what kind of data is going to be taken, in what form and by whom. And um, so that's the complete sort of worksheet that lends towards hopefully teaching the basic principles um, around this meaningful unit, ABC. Um, at the same time, it encourages brainstorming solutions, environmental changes to change behavior. How does that do? Is that, does it, that summarize it? Was that what you kind of had in mind? Yeah, that was uh, extremely comprehensive. It was more comprehensive than I thought you were going to offer in a good way, in a positive way. Um, super helpful. I'm <laughs> curious... Uh, and, and just before I share my curiosity with you, you, you said that now it's common knowledge and I reflect on 2023 and 2016, if we were to record this episode then, uh, I might be asking questions like, can you explain what the ABCs are to this audience right. of our podcast show? And now I don't feel like we need to go that far back. However... There might, I know that our podcast show attracts uh, highly knowledgeable, highly skilled, highly experienced professionals, and I know it also attracts those who are right at the beginning of their sure. animal training journey and uh, are just hearing about this for the first time. What? So let's say you, you are that person and you listen yeah. to this podcast and you, you get curious about this fade form. What base knowledge, or, or, or is that a good starting point, or what base knowledge would those people need to know before being able to really leverage the power of this tool? Well, it is designed to teach as it's being used. Um, I, I don't know exactly how successful it is at doing that. That would be an interesting 
um, master's thesis for somebody who's looking for a question um, to investigate. But it's designed by um, through questions that would lead the person to develop an antecedent behavior consequence summary statement. And so I think it's a it's a great tool. Well, I know I know that it's a great tool for beginners and for um, more experienced people because I know of both beginners and experienced people who find it so and give me that feedback. Is it all there is? I think sometimes people are really kind of tilting at windmills to find criticism, that being critical is more reinforcing than um, being supportive or, or finding what is of value about something. So I would remind us that at no point is just the fade form sufficient. We also want to teach people to be very keen observers of behavior environment relations. Um, We want them to be more practiced at describing behavior unambiguously and observably. We want them to continue to practice looking in the environment for answers to the why and when questions. So, you know, it's, it's a piece of a very big and amazing puzzle that is behavior on the planet. Um, It also is not meant to deny the importance of genes or brain function or thoughts and emotions, Um, but it is that slice which asks that narrow, perhaps, but very um, important and useful question about how the environment is influencing the behavior of interest. And and for for, for everyone, when when is this tool one they would reach for? I know through my journey, any time I got stuck on anything with behavior, especially at the start, I was reached for the fade, and I I found times oh actually this isn't the tool, and and I'm grateful I did that because uh, I've got that learning history now to understand its relevance to particular problems for me for example maybe not when I'm trying to figure out my next approximation and the shaping plan but maybe if I have an animal living with a client who's um, causing some challenges in the home environment um, it might be a good place but can you in your words describe for the listeners when this tool would be recommended? Yeah I think it's it's useful whenever it facilitates asking and answering the questions that it that it poses. So those questions are, when is the behavior likely to occur? Those are the antecedent um, questions. Ante meaning the um, influences over behavior that occur before the behavior happens. And when you're interested in asking the why. Why would a reasonable, rational animal um, choose to behave in this way? What outcome is the behavior producing of interest? And so when that's your question, then the first half of the form is is great for fostering thinking about that. And then when you want to ask, what can I do about it? It will facilitate asking, what can the animal do instead that still produces those valued reinforcers that the so-called problem behavior was producing? And uh, what new skills? So whenever those are the questions you need answers to, um, that's the worksheet I think that will be helpful. Uh, maybe it takes some practice knowing when that's the questions that you need to be asking. I can see that uh, within a shaping plan, knowing what your next approximation is, is not going to be facilitated by the when, if, then of ABC analysis. Um, Yeah, and that's an example where um, we're talking about implementation, not planning. So when we're implementing a solution, when we're implementing a teaching or training solution, when we're changing the environment to make a different behavior more likely, and when we're using reinforcers to select for a different behavior, Behavior and to deselect for the problem behavior, um, then then we're in a different phase of teaching, and that's a phase that I think the skills we most need are dialogue skills, observation, asking animals, seeing the answers, and then dynamically changing what we do based on what the animal is telling us. 
approximation by approximation. So yeah, those are different phases of caring for one another from a learning perspective. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm grateful to have your voice help articulate that and clarify that for the listeners because Animal Training Academy is all about helping our audience get unstuck. Uh, and our community focuses on that. We know no matter how experienced or knowledgeable you are, inevitably you're going to hit some rough patches. Um, and you connected a dot for me there. And the question, why would a reasonable, rational animal behave this way, immediately connects via neurons in my brain to crucial conversations where a question gets asked, why would a reasonable and rational person act this way, which is the same question. But I've never taken that and linked it to the fade form, so I'm grateful for that. All right, so if you're listening to this and maybe you've never used the fade form before and you have a challenge that you want to try using it with for the first time, or maybe you've used it multiple times before and you can think of some times when you're using it, you still might have felt stuck at the end of going through it. Susan, I'm curious about your experience in teaching this and, and using it. Are there parts of the fade form and process and social specific challenges where you have found people still get stuck even after going through it all the way? And if so, what are these parts slash challenges? And if they're multiple paired with each, what are, what are some ways we can overcome them? Yeah, that's an interesting question for sure. Um, and it comes up every time that I teach these basic principles about the relation between behavior and the environment. <clears throat> And how that um, level of analysis, behavior in environment, um, rather than gene expression and inhibition, or rather than brain um, synaptic connections and chemicals, whenever I teach, you know, the behavioral level of analysis, and we take time for my students to uh, select a, a problem behavior situation and um, try and do, identify the antecedents that set the occasion for the behavior and the consequences that make that behavior valuable, worthwhile. Um, it's not uncommon that people will say, I don't know when, it just happens. So they have a hard time identifying the critical antecedents. And one of the ways that we can help people with that is first of all, to continue to give them confidence that on this particular planet anyway, behavior does not spew out of us. I always say like a leaky garden hose, right? You've heard me say that for 25 years now. Um, it's just such an apt metaphor when I think about it. Um, behavior is not inside the animal waiting to spray out independent of what the animal's genetic history learning history, and current conditions are. Since we can't change genetics directly and we can't change history directly, current conditions holds the premier spot in our work because we can change current condition. So when people say, it, I don't know when it happens, it just happens all the time, it just pops out of nowhere, that's when you need you know, someone to help you and the work she does ask questions that are meant to guide you past getting stuck there by asking things like, does it happen when particular people are around? Does it happen when you make a demand, you know, a, a, a difficult, ask for a difficult behavior? Does it happen during certain times of day or when food is around? And so to get unstuck, first we need the confidence that this unit describes how behavior works at the behavioral level. And with that confidence, then we can either keep looking or we can try and compete with whatever that is by arranging an environment with different antecedents, you know. So that's one approach. Um, the other place that people get stuck frequently is they might say that they don't know what the consequence is. And you hear that a lot for <clears throat> persistent behaviors, behaviors that are very repetitive across time, like barking, incessant barking, or a, a companion parrot incessantly vocalizing, um, or with stereotypic behavior in zoos, like bears pacing, or self-injurious behavior, like pulling fur, or tearing skin, biting. People will often report getting stuck there. 
<clears throat> Excuse me for this froggy voice. Spring is coming. That's the good news. So allergies come with it. So when that happens, again, I think the most important thing I try and give people is not an answer, but that confidence that there is something that is produced by behavior, that that's how behavior works. And that's when I often use that um, that activity. You know, nobody says, but what are eyes for? You know, or what are ears for? Um, what are legs for? You know, or all the different adaptations of being... Um, you know, part of the system on the planet. But when you ask people, what is behavior for? Very rarely do people have a fluent answer. <clears throat> and I think that's because we're raised in the cultural fog about behavior. And that's evidence of that. We should be able to say as fluently what behavior is for as, as we do our other adaptations. So giving people the confidence that there are meaningful consequences or the behavior would not continue is sometimes the best we can do. And then say, if you can't spy what that is, then we move on to the intervention and make sure that we use really strong reinforcers for whatever the alternative or new skills um, behaviors are going to be. And we talk about that as competing with the unknown function of the problem behavior. I think confidence is such a sought after feeling state from our members, I think that a lot of us are asking, do we have what it takes? Are we good enough to be trainers? I help my clients every day, yet come home to my own animal who has these behavioral problems. You know, like Luke Skywalker in Star Wars asking, if it, is, is he really a Jedi? Um, we, we face that challenge as well. How, how, do we, how do we two things give confidence to individuals and how does one develop confidence? What are, what are approximations that people can take to build their skill set at going through this process? Yeah, that's so interesting because I don't think of confidence as a feeling. So I think what we feel is pain and then we give it a name in the context of our work. Yeah. And we call that feeling, that painful feeling, um, in the context of not being able to help a client identify the antecedents and consequences, um, a lack of confidence. So I try, I have a kind of different take on this confidence issue and the imposter syndrome and all of that. Um, I think that that pain of um, being unsure or unsuccessful, it has function evolutionarily. It, it is the, um, the antecedent occasion setter that gets us digging for answers, coming to our community for help, um, going back to the research, you know, um, making use of our interdisciplinary team and our, our particular, you know, like the ATA community. So I think it has function. Um, I remember it's a little bit adjacent to this question or to this point, but when I was writing up my dissertation, um, which I found, you know, very difficult. I didn't have the academic prerequisites one should have to be doing that work. And um, very stressful. I, I was finishing the final chapter, chapter five, the discussion, the final chapter. And as I hit the full stop key, my computer blinked out. And when I, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You can't see Ryan's face, but it was exactly what I hope you all felt for a moment, a hard stop. And um, I, you know, rebooted the computer and it was gone. Chapter five, which I had so painfully um, cast into the written word, was gone. And I remember it was close to midnight and I phoned my major professor and I said, chapter five is gone. I lost it on the computer. And I felt like, you know, jumping off a cliff. And he said to me, uh, he was Australian. I wish I could imitate his, his accent, Alan Hoffmeister. He said, that's all right, mate. Just put on the coffee and call me when it's redone. And he hung up, you know, but what I, which I did. But what I remember is um, the importance of having somebody to call, you know. And um, another time when I felt the pain of losing something on the computer, I called Carl Cini my current mentor, who turned 89 last month, or I, I wrote him, I think, it was an email. And in great angst and agony, I wrote him and said, I just lost, you know, an important thing I was writing. What the hell is the purpose of punishment? 
Why do we feel this pain? Why did we evolve with this, you know, feature of being alive? And he wrote back and said, you're going to hit control save more? Yeah. And I said, oh man, (laughs) yes, I am. I'm going to hit control S to save the document every few minutes. And I still do. And when I work with someone else, I'm always on the phone saying, did you hit, did you save it? Did you save it? So I think that pain that we feel that we label a lack of confidence in the work context is functional. And that if we, instead of escaping it, take a look at what is the source? What do we need to know so that we don't feel that level of pain again? Are we really ready to be doing a particular consult? Um, And if not, where can we go to build those skills? Or are we ready? But sometimes it doesn't, our best work still fails. Um, And feeling badly, you know, is the internal setting that uh, helps us think about what we can do better next time. So that's what I have to give you and your wonderful members is when you feel that pain, that lack of confidence or or a failure. You know, I, I don't need a euphemism, a failure, an error, a mistake, all of those words that people work hard to escape. I say, you know, bring it on because there's information in the emotion that is describing this essentially punishment contingency and we can make use of it and we make better use of it and feel better when we check in with each other, when we have a community to check in with to help us do it better next time. It reminds me of talking about a challenge with Emily johnson Vay, and she offered why don't you just reframe some of the words you're using, Ryan, and use the word curious instead, which Mm -hmm. I feel is like what you just did there, Mm -hmm. is asked good questions which lead to good outcomes. Uh, And now we just use Google Docs and it automatically saves for us (laughs) technology. (laughs) But it has its problems, Google Docs, as well. So that's life on the planet, you know. It's tough. Well, now and we just get chat GPT to rewrite chapter five for us. Oh my gosh, I know. That's been quite the conversation for my Sunday dinners with Carl. Yeah. So the solution is to keep looking, uh, try to compete with whatever consequences unidentified and is there, or reach out and, and ask for help. Another challenge I think people get stuck on is doing a fade or whatever tool or rubric you're using to solve whatever problem you have and then hitting a brick wall because of resources of time money knowledge where we just covered what you could do in that situation and what what might you have to say just before we move on to people whom and and you shared in a ata podcast episode or one of the live sessions you've done with our members a story about an elephant you're working with in a zoo Uh, maybe you can quickly recap that what what input do you have about getting stuck because you've got the solution but you don't have the resources to implement yeah you know it's so interesting often i have occasion to say to people listen all we've got at our level of analysis where we're expert changing behavior through learning by changing conditions our antecedents and consequences. If we need to change behavior another way, then what is that way? We can bring in the veterinarian and do a pharma- pharmacological solution. Um, it's not either or. Sometimes we do both. I mean, optimally, we would, if we need medicine, we would also have a behavior analysis program going. Um, And the same is true about resources. We can only do what we can with the resources that we have. But I never assume that when someone says we have no resources, that that's the end of the conversation. So I think this is a good time to be fluent in making that case to the people who hold the purse strings, whether it's the client you're consulting with or yourself, or a zoo budget. Um, the case with the elephant, and I know that um, the many of the keepers from that zoo are uh, follow your wonderful um, podcasts and other work, um, was that we had a, a reasonable plan, a plan that we had good confidence in uh, having an impact on this elephant's uh, self-injurious behavior. 
But in order to implement the plan, they would need more staff and more of a budget for things that were very expensive, like uh, timed feeders. And the first answer was, well, you know, we don't have a budget for those things. Um, But the lead person, Petty Grieve, I don't think she'd mind my sharing my admiration for her, the breadth of her impact, um, went back to her supervisor, who also deserves a shout out, um, Lisa, because she listened and heard and found the resources that we need. That experience did teach me that... um, There are different problems, and they're not all behavior environment problems. Sometimes they're resource problems. But in that case, it does well for us to know that so that we could say to the head of the zoo, well, if you don't have the resources, then just let it be known that this is not a failure of the behavioral solution. This is a failure of a budget. At least let's get that down in the minutes of this meeting, is that it's not that the science of behavior change failed us. It's that the available resources failed us. And I think that's very powerful. And when we work with individual clients, I have had experience with people saying, oh, well, I couldn't do that, and I can't afford this, and I won't be able to do that, and I can't move the couch, and I can't do this, and I can't do that. And my answer is just very calmly, we have antecedent control or influencers, and we have consequences. If we can't change behavior with one or both of those, then we have to admit we're not going to be able to have an impact. If you're expecting your animal to change their behavior without changing conditions, you got to move to another planet. Or you use drugs, which is really changing the environment as well. It's changing the internal environment. But without new skills, you know, that won't work well either in the long run. So that's part of the confidence is to know what we what we have in our toolbox. It's circumscribed. It's not infinite and endless. Creative application of those basic principles is endless and infinite. But the principles themselves are limiting in the way that gravity is limiting. If you want to wake up in the morning to your ceiling, you know, with your feet on the ceiling, then you have to uh, change the limits of gravity. And if you want to change behavior through a learning solution without changing conditions, you have to figure out a way to change the limits of learning. Lots to think about there. I'm going to push on in the interest of time because there's two other things I really wanted to cover today. But firstly, thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, I know the listeners of the show are going to find that super valuable. Um, next, though, I want to talk about a, a function that might be identified when doing a fade, and, and that is distance. For example, an animal might behave in an effort to increase the distance from an aversive stimuli. And part of the fade has us think about a behavior our learner already knows. It could serve the same purpose as the problem behavior. Or maybe we want to use that same purpose slash function for helping to teach a new behavior. And with these thoughts, we start exploring negative reinforcement contingencies. This isn't inherently bad. However, there are some important considerations to think about when using this. I was hoping that you might share what some of these are. Yeah, it's an important realization and acknowledgement to bring into our toolbox negative reinforcement for just the right situation. And it's been interesting for me to learn, um, to connect some dots around negative reinforcement. You've all heard me say so many times that every animal has a right to say no. But it wasn't until Jesus Rosales Ruiz said to me, you know, he was sitting on my left in the faculty meetup after a clicker expo day. And just he quietly said to me, you know, whenever an animal says no, that's negative reinforcement. And I remember looking at him, turning my head, looking at him, thinking I had just never connected that dot. So I was very grateful for that and many other things that I've learned. You know, if I if I cited where I've learned the things that I know, there would not be one sentence without a citation coming out of my mouth. And I really do take great joy in having a community and influencers over my own my own knowledge. So it was clear to me, probably because I was a kid who spent my entire public school days in the principal's office for misbehavior, 
it's always been very important and clear to me that animals need power to control their outcomes. That being bossed around, to, you know, when to eat, what to eat, how much to eat, you know, people are even filling your plate and your milk glass and then making you finish it. Um, you know, it's a really um, overpowering world. And I always was very close to that experience and the, the, the suffering, you know, as a little child that goes along with that. Um, so the idea, the reason why I go there is because I think that this, the seed was planted very, very early in my life, that animals have a right to control their outcomes to the greatest degree. And learning, teaching them how to do that well is the job of trainers, teachers, parents. And um, that idea that every individual should have a behavior that is respected as a no behavior. So I brought that sort of bias um, to my work with non-human animals. And it is implicit in the model that I've been teaching um, where we have the three ABC paths. The one in the middle is our ABC of the problem behavior of interest. And then we ask the next path is how can we replace that behavior but preserve those meaningful consequences that the problem behavior produced. And then the third path is um, what new skills. So if we think of that as, you know, maybe three tines on a fork, we want to address all three of those to the greatest degree possible. It's that second path where I have been teaching, that's where the animal gets to say no. That when, for example, you put, offer your hand to a parrot, wanting them to step onto your hand, or you um, hold the leash, wanting your dog to come closer with its collar, that you give an animal a way to say, no, I don't want to step on your hand or I don't want you to attach a leash to my collar, or for a child to say, no, I don't want to brush my teeth, but that we as the teachers, our job is to shape that no communication, that negative reinforcement of doing something more to escape the hand, to escape the leash, to escape toothbrushing, that we shape how the individual says no so that it still meets the negative reinforcement escape or avoidance function, but does it in a way that keeps the learner successful, you know, in our environments, keeps the dog successful in our home, the kid as well, um, the elephant successful at having its feet, you know, uh, footwork done. And then when an animal says no, and we honor that behavior and we shape it by moving away with smaller and smaller, safer and safer behaviors. So now instead of getting bitten, the animal just needs to lean back. Then we need to ask ourselves, why would a reasonable, rational animal say no? We take the responsibility back into our court to devise an improved training plan so that animals say yes more often. So there's quite a lot to it. And I think those three paths, the first is the ABC for the problem. The bird isn't stepping onto my hand when I offer my hand. Then we ask, what can they do instead? You know, let's say the bird bites my hand when I offer my hand. We ask, what can they do instead? They can lean back and I'll remove my hand. And then we ask, how can we train the yes? How can we have them jumping onto our hand as soon as we offer it with, you know, great enthusiasm, low latency? Yeah. And um, so that's where negative reinforcement comes in to a system that has been, you know, a long standing um, and effective approach to solving behavior problems. What can the animal do instead for the same escape function? And how can we compete with escape? so that animals approach with great enthusiasm instead. So what we've got is the initial behavior problem is often about escape. The dog growls, the bird bites, the kid starts screaming and running around the house. We've got another escape contingency when we replace that behavior with something more successful, successful, safer, less intense, and allow escape to be the function or arrange escape. And then we've got our positive reinforcement path, which is the new skills so that animals choose to approach instead. So that's where I see um, 
you know, negative reinforcement having always been in the model. And I've just been slow to see it through that particular lens until the recent discussions of negative reinforcement. And so are there, are there any other, for people who use the FADE and identify a negative reinforcement contingency and as or part of their intervention have... Uh, the option to say no, which they all are, if not 99% of them. Um, are there any other considerations we need to add to what you've already shared when having, knowingly having and being very clear about what the negative reinforcement contingencies are? Well, you know, I I remember somebody laughing when I posed the possibility in sort of a brainstorming mode Maybe we need two different ways of talking about negative reinforcement. The negative reinforcement that gives animals a way to say no, which is their right, as far as I'm concerned, philosophically, mm. versus the kind of negative reinforcement that is uh, part of usually unnecessary coercion that Sidman was talking about when he listed punishment and negative reinforcement as forms of coercion we should not be using to the greatest degree possible. So we're really talking about two different, is the word applications or two different scenarios, classes of behavior of the trainer One is when you step back when an animal um, lunges at you to bite. And the other is, you know, using ear pinches to keep a dog in the heel position or or, um, laces, harnesses around a nose to teach a dog to keep a head back in the competitive arena or, um, yeah, or shock fences, prong collars, you know. We tend to think of those as often the positive punishment side. But once we've used that positive punisher, the animal's escape behavior of the punisher, then in the behavior stream becomes negative reinforcement. So that's the use of negative reinforcement that I think our community Um, you know, does not condone under, you know, I never throw a tool away, but I'm always, you know, seeking to change the frequency of use, you know, where in the cultural fog, punishment and negative reinforcement in that coercive version, common coercive version, is a very low frequency. And that the use of positive reinforcement um, learning is very, very high in an animal's life, that they're able to control their reinforcers, their positive reinforcers. And now we can say they need to control their negative reinforcers as well. We need to allow them a way to escape. But then the very next thing we need to do is to ask, what about the environment I've arranged for this training? Um, Is setting the occasion for escape to be the chosen um, behavior consequence unit? And we need to change what we do. So um, I think people need to have a way to talk about the difference between, you know, um, the purposeful, coercive use of negative reinforcement Versus the negative reinforcement that gives animals the influence over their environment to move something they're uncomfortable with away. Well, I'm glad we got to talk about this today. And again, uh, comprehensive uh, covering of that part of what might, what will be, uh, depending on what kind of negative reinforcement we're talking about, part of your intervention that you develop through the use of fate and i love that every 50 episodes we get to hear everything you've learned over the subsequent years and how the conversations and the offerings in our community have been influencing your thinking which is very relevant to the last thing that i wanted to pick your brains on today for episode 200 coming back to the fade another part of it and that you shared with us earlier in this podcast episode is to examine distant antecedents, asking what relevant background conditions may indirectly affect the problem behavior. Does the animal have any medical or physical conditions? And if so, is the animal on medication or under other treatment for them? Describe the animal's diet and eating routines. Describe the animal's typical activity schedule. Describe the animal's typical rest slash sleep schedule. And describe the animal's enclosure or living area. Over the last wee while, I understand you have been incorporating into your thinking and teaching a conceptualization from Joe Lang around non-linear contingency analysis in LCA. 
not a new concept, but the formal structure it offers is, in your opinion, powerful. Can did I did I get that right? And can you unpack what I just said for our listeners? What is <laughs> yeah, NLCA, <I> <laughs> and, and what does it add to our thinking about distant antecedents? Why is this powerful? Well, again, I think that it was in the model, and all these years I've called it uh, distant antecedents. And I think what um, I've I've worked hard to understand what uh, Joe is bringing us from Gold Diamond related to his clinical work, um, related to this nonlinear contingency analysis. Um, first of all, I trust that if it's important to Joe, it's something that I need to listen to and figure out. I may not agree, you know, at the end, I always give myself permission to have a different opinion, but I don't go there fast. And I certainly don't go there just because it's something new to my ears. But as I've been sorting it out, um, I recently wrote uh, an attempt to explain it clearly and in ways that are directly relevant to the previous ways we've talked about behavior and ABC assessment. Um, and I posted on, on my Facebook page. I don't know if you've seen that, Ryan, but if not, maybe I could direct your listeners to go take a look at that on the Behavior Works Facebook page. And I did it because I think that um, people are explaining it and it's not making it less confusing or more valuable, in my humble opinion. So um, one of the things that's very reinforcing to me is to try and simplify um, a complicated concept um, and describe it so that people can more easily understand it, judge it, pick it up, use it, or let it go. And so that finally came clear. I was actually on the phone with Rick Hester talking about, you know, what is the nonlinear aspect of this phrase, nonlinear contingency analysis? Because my background is in research design and statistics in my graduate program. And nonlinear to me means curvilinear. You know, if it's not a straight line, then it's a U shape. I, I couldn't figure out really, you know, it amazes me, but I tend to be slow to understand some of these academic applications of these words. And maybe that's in our community's favor, because if it's not making sense to me, maybe there's someone else that's not making sense to. And then I kind of really work hard you know, tapping away at the concept until it finally uh, reveals the gold ribbon in the mountain I've been, you know, mining for. And, um, you know, in the synergy, talking with the Behavior Works consultants, and on this issue, it was Rick that evening, um, it finally dawned on me what the nonlinear reference was to. I have always taught the heart of all understanding is that problem behavior ABC, and then I've added more ABCs that are linked to that ABC. That is the contingency. By contingency, I mean ABC, the contingency that goes before, that occurs before the problem ABC. And we could even look, we can tag on another contingency that happens in a linear, in a line after the problem ABC. And I call those other people too, I've discovered in behavior analysis recently call it the behavior stream. And those are linear in the sense that, you know, the ABC that an ends in positive punishment then becomes the linear ABC to come, that is negative reinforcement. So we can line up these ABCs in a linear format like um, train cars. And that would be the behavior stream of contingencies or the, you know, the train cars, each car representing a connected um, in time, a connected ABC contingency. Once I explained that, the central ABC, the train car ABCs were going to connect, then it hit me. What is nonlinear are all those contingencies in the distant antecedents that are powerful influences over our critical problem ABC. And here's the, here's the great nugget. I hope Joe would agree. The great nugget is that not only are there other ABCs in that distant can, and not only are they potentially influential, which is why we put them in there in the first place, nothing new for me there, but the idea that if you solve one of those ABCs, 
you might resolve the problem behavior without ever even directly working on the problem behavior. Boom. Now, after years of talking with Joe and listening to others explaining Joe and, you know, just really not being able to own it with my own understanding, I, I felt like I got it now. Well, that that's very powerful. And the example I used in the write-up on Facebook was of um, an employee that I work with on the help desk at the university that I ran for 10 years, who was late every day. And I used the best crucial conversations and psychology therapy skills that I could come up with. Um, and nothing we worked on together changed her behavior of being late until I asked her, what's the obstacle? That was essentially the nonlinear contingency question. What contingency is moving you to be late that is not linearly connected to the lateness, that is not one of the train cars connected to the problem behavior of being late? Brainstorm with me things that are not related to this train. And she said, well, my child needs to be put on the bus and I wave goodbye, I hand her her lunch. At the same time, I would need to get in the car to come to work if I was going to be on time. Wow. You know, I am so supportive of that level of parenting that our solution was to move the opening of the help desk so she could both put her child lovingly on the bus and leisurely and safely come to work on time. And we didn't have a tardy, tardiness problem after that. So in what ways do we not just like... like um Throwing dirty socks into the hamper. Oh, that can go into the distant antecedent. The animal had a neglectful background. Oh, that can go into the distant antecedent hamper. The animal suffered um, poor nutrition. Oh, that can go into the hamper. Now we can kind of dive into the hamper and root around all these socks and say, ooh, those penguins don't have enough caves. And so they're not going to swim because they don't want to give up the cave dwelling. Ooh, my colleague at the help desk needs that time to put her kid on the bus. We can change the time we open the help desk. So it's about really looking at those contingencies we've tossed into the distant antecedent hamper, if you will, and saying, what if, what about these contingencies that are not part of the train, but influence where that train is going to go? Can I really look at and address And sometimes in addressing them, I will discover that the problem is resolved by resolving these related, but not in a linear way, contingencies. You could see the enormous um, benefit that this thinking would have to clinical work, to clinical psychology with people, to say to somebody, you know, I see that you are um, biting your nails to the point of them bleeding, and you've tried all these habit-breaking programs, but none of them are effective. Let's talk about some other influential contingencies that might be the antecedents in the big picture of, of our concepts to you biting your nails. So we, you know, having them squeeze a ball instead might not work. Having them put yucky tasting nail polish on might not work. But addressing other contingencies in their lives that might reduce their stress, tension, worry might have an influence. So again, I don't think that this is outside the model that we've been using all along. You know me, I always ask that question. How does this information that's new to my ears fit with what I do know about how behavior works? And, you know, you fit it perfectly into the distant antecedent. And then we get to say, well, does this help us or is this just more rhetoric, more in the interest of people finding breakthroughs and, you know, distinguishing themselves and us getting bored and needing novelty and you know, what is it? I'm always such a skeptic. Um, but when I rooted around and continued to work on it, um, continued to read Gold Diamond's work, listen to Joe, watch people um, describing their use of it, then um, it came clear to me that there is there is benefits. Not that I'm, you know, the lord of the what's valuable in behavior castle, but for me, I had to find out what is valuable. And if I'm going to move it forward in my work, I need to understand what does it add? 
And I just want to say one more thing. I had a, a, an insight just the other day, really as a result of Clicker Expo. Um, hearing these uh, new ways of expressing, looking, and analyzing um, behavior doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. By that, I mean, when we add something new, it doesn't mean we have to get rid of something old, unless we decide that there's an improvement and we can retire it. Like if we retired positive punishment, except for only very rarely, um, that would be a good thing overall. So that I wanted to share that too with you is that when we bring in new clarity and new new information and new skills to our model, not that they're new to behavior analysis, but they're new to us as a community, we can ask the additive question. And when I asked the additive question, that's when I realized, oh, that's what I've been tossing into distant antecedents. And now it's worth pulling it out of that hamper and saying, ooh, let's, let's work with this and see where it gets us to improving welfare of animals in our care. Yeah. So I wanted to just share that insight that we don't have to subtract something because we're adding. We can just keep adding clarity, insight, tools, skills, and improve the planet. Well, everyone, this has been episode 200 of the ATA podcast. What's valuable in the behavior castle of Lordus Freedom? Thank you. <laughs> no, don't do it. <laughs> hey. Don't put fuel on that fire. <laughs> when, when we bring in... When you add something new, we don't have to get rid of something else. Does this new clarity mean that you're going to tweak and add something new to the fade form to help guide people's understanding and consequent application of what they can understand from that part of the fade form? Or are you going to not? <laughs> yeah. So I need to think about with you, you know, is it there? I need to go back to those questions and ask, is it there clearly or does it need more technical language like nonlinear contingency analysis? Might we just add something like, you know, are there other ABCs that are influencing the problem behavior that if we identified them and changed those contingencies, would that help influence the problem behavior? So we need to think about it and think about how to express it in ways that can be readily used because even the word contingency has only really become clear to me in the last 15 years, let's say. I remember struggling over the word operant when I first learned it in 1980. Operant? What the heck is that? An operant class. What? You know? And now many of us use that word, you know, to mean roughly voluntary, roughly striated muscles versus smooth muscles and glands or um, not innate learned. You know, we, we are comfortable with the meaning of the term. We got to call it something. The magic's not in the word. It's in the meaning we give the word. We could call it Dumbledore, classes of Dumbledores, right? But we call it operants. It's an ingenious term that the individual is the operator. Amazing. But um, it's only in the last decade or so that the word contingency, meaning the ABC unit, was really clear to me. And it came from, you know, fitting emotions into our model to say that emotions are generated by the same things that generate the behavior. What generates behavior? Antecedents and consequences. So let the learning continue, you know, how we learn early on that the biggest reinforcer is knowing instead of learning. It's holding back this planet. Let the learning continue. Let the changing what we do and say continue. Let the figuring out what words mean continue forever, because that's where our greatest progress is going to be. Not in having the main reinforcer being, I'm a knower, you're not. I'm right, you're wrong. But you said this last year, you don't get to change what you say this year. These are terrible things in our culture. Well, I think that is the perfect place to wrap this up. So Susan, so much gratitude to you for being part of this tradition. Uh, before we officially end, though, could you just tell everyone listening where they can go to find out more about FADE, find a form, learn about LLA, what you do, all of the other courses you're now offering via your legacy and your platform, um, and, and get in touch. Where's the best place to find you? Thank you. 
all of that they can contact you for because you've been such a wonderful supporter of uh, this endlessly building work. Um, and so thank you so much, Ryan, for the collegiality, the co-support and learning that we've shared for so long now. And I do remember when you first came up to me at that conference and you said exactly this, I want to do what you're doing. And I said, well, welcome on board. <laughs> that, that was great. Um, so if you go to behaviorworks.org, uh, you'll find what you need there, although so much of it is also within the ATA community, um, which is fabulous. You'll find um, everything on that website is available to you, free of charge, download, print, put on the back of your T-shirts. Um, I've been hesitant to get on Instagram all these years and um, have somebody now, Erica Austin, and my daughter, Leah, who's helping me um, put together material for Instagram. So hopefully you'll see me there soon with some hopefully useful information. Um, but everything's on the website and the Behavior Works Facebook page. A few years ago, I realized that I was at a place in my career where if I wanted to leave a legacy, so to speak, I needed to start bringing in other people to continue um, the Behavior Works mission. And so to that end, we have Nicole um, Fowler-Sadowski teaching uh, Retrieving While Walking, and that's a course coming up. Um, in June, we have the great Christine, Christy Allegood teaching research, and she now is offering a once a month journal reading group. So go take a look at that. And we have the wonderful Lori Stevens teaching a movement class, which she originally was teaching to build strength and coordination in the dogs. And I've kept kind of pushing her to see that when you can teach a dog strength and coordination, you have to be a really great trainer. So her course will help your training skills, observation and training skills. So those are three new courses, four new courses. And... Um, and then the research, uh, the Behavior Works consultants that work with me at zoos and other facilities, Rick Hester, Bianca Papadopoulos, and Megan Sanders, and Amy Schills, all of whom, all of these people are people whom I learn more from than I teach. And so how smart is this designer I am to have all of these really great um, behaviorists around me to keep my learning going? Um, so check all of that out and we'll see see what the next uh, 100 podcasts worth of time produces for Behavior Works. <laughs> That's a smart model. I've been doing it now for 200 episodes. I don't remember saying that to you at the conference, but I do remember asking Nick Bishop who his mentor was. He said Steve Martin, asking Steve who his mentor was. He said yeah. Susan Friedman and asking Susan who her mentor was. And he said, B, she said, be a Skinner. And I went, well, he's not around anymore, so I'm going to learn from Susan. <laughs> but now I realize I need to start harassing Carl Cheney just the way I've been harassing you for the last decade. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, he's really given me an important, I don't even know what to call it. Let's think about that. Every Sunday, um, yeah, Bianca and um, Amy were here uh, on their way to ABMA and um, were able to be part of those uh, that that day it was a Saturday dinner with him. And uh, yeah, to spread his generosity and his knowledge of behavior to as many people as possible is really a celebration of his life. So yeah. Fantastic. Well, we will link to everything in the show notes today. This has been so much fun. Let's do it again, Susan, in a couple of years. How about 50 uh, more? <laughs> so from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on episode 200 today. Woo -woo. It's really <laughs> appreciated. Thank you. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu 
to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behaviour geeks. That's it for this episode though, we're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening, you'll hear from us again soon.